Here's a brief but annoying message to let you know that you could have first heard this episode nine months ago if you were a subscriber to our Iron Filing Society Patreon offering. For the price of a pint and a St Clement's each month, you can get up to four episodes a week, nine months before the rest of the world gets them. Early access to regular episodes, lots of other marvellous benefits, and there's absolutely no adverts or brief but annoying messages like this that will get right on your tits. Find out more and subscribe now at tftimemachine.com slash ironfilings. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, this is it. This is Top Flight Time Machine. I am Andy Hotbody Dawson. Bow, bow, bow. I'm Sam Nifty Delaney. So what? Uh, welcome along. It's a history box today. It's usually a Tuesday we do these, but today it's out on a Thursday because we've switched it with the Melchester episode because in the Melchester episode on ch- Tuesday, yeah, we talked about diving into Euro 80, mm. um, which is what we're going to do now. It was the first tournament I remember as a kid, just before my 8th birthday. Uh, well, I do remember World Cup 78, to be honest, a bit. Mm. Um, England weren't in that. Uh, it didn't, I don't think they got the, the coverage. Uh, well, Scotland were in it, so we'll have got a lot of coverage. I mainly remember the final, Argentina beating Holland and all the ticker tape and all that kind of yeah. thing. I remember going out into Ken the Pace. garden and playing, going out in the garden at half time during that match and playing football because I wanted to be in the World Cup final. Yeah, that's what you always did during any big tournament. You'd go out and you'd play yeah. it. And yeah. sometimes you'd miss some of the actual game because you'd get so excited yeah. watching the game, it, it would be... just make you itch to play the game. Yeah. Mind you, I used to get that movies as well. I'd watch a film. And I'd just be sitting there mm. thinking, oh, I cannot wait to play this when I get home. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you'd be watching yeah. Star Wars and you'd be like, this is really good, yeah. but not half as good as it's going to be when I play when it I at home. home. Yeah. <laughs> so Euro 80, um, we'll have a little look at that maybe over an episode well, or two. What, what, what the, um, I have no recollection of this. I was five years old. I've got zero recollection. The first thing I've got any recollection of tournament-wise is Spain 82. And uh, yeah. I actually fell out with my two of my best mates, who were the other two West Ham fans in my class. Um, one of whom was the kid who actually got me into West Ham. And we fell out because they said to celebrate the 82 World Cup, we, we're going to do various things in the school. And one of the things we're going to be doing is we want you to, um, you're going to cut out life size. We're going to give you big sheets of paper, right? You know those big rolls of paper? Yeah. Then you're going to lie on it. Someone's going to fucking lie Whoa. on it, right? And yeah. and your mate's going to draw an outline around you, right? And then yeah. you're going to cut it out, and what you're going to have is a life-size outline of a man, well, a boy. Yeah. Right? And um, then what's going to happen is uh, you're going to get into groups, small groups, and you're going to paint that that person that mm. outline in a football kit of your choice, right? So yeah. I get together with my two mates, Alex, who's the kid who got me into West Ham in the first place, Alex Jones, and uh, and Ollie, who more of which later, because he's a character who has featured in this podcast again. But bear in mind, we're going back to when we were seven, right? Seven <laughs> years old. So we all go, let's do West Ham. And I remember thinking, mm, I don't know, though, this is a World Cup thing. Maybe they're going to want us to do international teams. So we go to the teacher. We go, can we do West Ham? Because that's who we all support. And the teacher obviously has zero interest in or knowledge of football. This has been, <laughs> this has been, um, this is this is, instruction has been handed down from the head's office, right? So she's just gone, fine. Well, you know, she was like, Miss Taylor, I hated her. She, I've told you about it before. She went, fine, I don't care. Yes, good. Do that, whatever whatever soccer team you prefer, <laughs> right? So we've gone brilliant. Now, of course, there's no fucking claret and blue. If it was Sunderland, no problem. You've got red, you've got white, you've got black, yeah. right? Claret and blue, difficult. So we go, what are we going to do, right? So we started getting into an argument about the colour. And I fucking remember distinctly that they were like, let's just do red because it's a dark red, really, isn't it? And we'll do the blue sleeves. And I was like, no, we'll make purple. Purple's closer, right? Yeah. And we were, and I was trying to make purple by mixing up the, what's that? Red and blue, isn't it, I think? Red and blue. Mm. Anyway, That's we so got eloquent. into it quite heavily. And I remember it. And we fell out. And it turned into an actual argument. 
and the teacher came over and go, what the fuck's going on here? And Alex and Ollie ganged up and they said, Sam's causing trouble. He's refusing to paint it in the colour we want to. He's trying to make a different colour. And it's, uh, you know, they were basically saying that I was being unreasonable. Now, both of them at the time were, they were, they had, they had more cachet in the class, let's say. They were on top table. Did you have right. hierarchy of tables in order of cleverness? Uh, yeah. Well, they were on the top one, and I was on either the bottom or one of the bottom ones, right? Oh. I hadn't yet flowered. It's fine. When I got older, I became like a, a good student. But back then, I was like, yeah, I was a bit, let's say I was slow on the uptake, right? Huh. But the okay. teacher was really like mean to the kids who she deemed to be less smart. Right. She was, it was just so, so old fashioned. Nowadays, probably if anything, it would be the other way around. Right. And she didn't like me and she'd been mean to me and those things. She went, Right, you're off this team. You can go sit over there and read it, but you're not involved in this anymore. And I got Fuck sacked hell. from the World Cup 82 arts and crafts thing, right? Which I'd been yeah. really looking forward to. Okay. Now, fast forward. That would have been 1982. Fast forward to 1992. And it was Euro 92, which took place mm. in, where was that one? Sweden? The one that Denmark won. Or was it, in fact, Germany? Mm. Can't remember. I've got a feeling it was Sweden. Listeners are now shouting it out. Yeah, it was the one that Denmark came off the beach yeah, to Yeah, Sweden, yeah. Right. Now, I'll see if you remember four this. Four venues. Perhaps, Just four perhaps, venues for that. Perhaps, perhaps some of the listeners will know what I'm referring to now. Like, real regular listeners will know this. It was quite, you know, it was a story that I, I felt made an impact at the time. We've just talked about 82. Ollie ganged up on me with Alex and got me thrown off painting the footballer. So I had to read on my own and be really bored, right? And I felt aggrieved. 1992, I've got the beers in and the crisps and I've hung a Union Jack on the wall to watch England versus Denmark in the opener of Euro 92. Ollie mm. doesn't show. Let's test your knowledge. Where was he? Do you remember? England, Denmark, 1992. I've arranged to watch it on the TV. Where's Ollie? I call his house. His dad answers. Is Ollie there? No, he went out a few hours ago. Was he coming to my house? No. Did he go out with that girl? He was going to Lynn's house. The yeah. girl that I had broken up with not yeah. two weeks previously. Yeah. So not only had he stood me up for a pre-arranged watching party of England, Denmark, he had actually gone round to hers in full well, right? <laughs> and was getting up to God knows what. I don't know. Mm. I don't want to know. Don't, don't, don't say it on this podcast. Don't give him the dignity of, of you saying what he would have done. We know what he did. Two things. Divided by 10 years. Mm. Both betrayals. Who was I at West Ham Chelsea with yesterday? Him. We're still mates. We're still best mates, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. But it's but a it sorry It's a sorry procession of um, betrayals, yeah. isn't it? From him. Still best mates, but you, you, you never feel as though you can fully trust him. I, and I say it to his face. And yeah. if he asks why, which he wouldn't, I'll tell him why, and then he'd just laugh and go, yeah, fair. What so he doesn't do? even have any remorse, I don't think. Maybe he's a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, he might be. Even if I accused him of that, he'd just laugh and go, yeah, probably. He told <laughs> me a good one yesterday. It? I've got to quickly tell you, sorry, before we get into Italy 1980, I've got to remember this now. On the train on the way back yesterday, I was telling him I had an Uber. This is more of a story for a Friday yet, but I've started now. I had a, <laughs> I had a massive situation with a fucking with Uber when I was in Dublin, right? A huge situation, right? Right. And to cut a long story short, I, it was the night before we were leaving, and we were leaving very early for the airport the next morning. So I decided because there was a coach, but we were leaving at like four thirty a.m. Andy, I didn't want to be walking Ugh. to the coach stop with my son at four thirty a.m. So I thought I'll pre-book a, an Uber. I don't know if you've ever tried to pre-book an Uber, but don't fucking bother me, right? Yeah, he kept the saying, "There's an error on the app. There's an error. You know, it says there's been an error. Sorry, try again. So I press the try again button. There's been an error. Sorry, try again. Press the try again button. I do it nine times, and in the end, I give up. Till I get a notification from Amex saying 
oh, these are the charges that have just gone onto your card. They charged me for the fare from my hotel to Dublin Airport nine times. Fucking nine hell. times. And it was about 50 euros, Andy. Right? So I'm sat in my hotel room the night before we leave, and I'm trying to call Uber on a Friday night to get these, these um, charges cancelled, right? Mm. Meanwhile... I've gone on Uber Eats and ordered us a couple of pizzas to the hotel room and I've paid for the speedy delivery option, which is an extra two pounds. But right. we had to have an early night and my son was starving. It's taken an hour, right? So Go I'm on, simultaneously mighty. calling Uber Cars to say you've just charged me nine times for a car that's not even coming. And I'm trying to get in touch with Uber Eats to say the pizza I ordered and paid extra for has not fucking turned up, Right. Yeah. So I'm stressing my fucking nuts off here, right? I'm fuming about Uber. Yesterday on the way back from my son Chelsea, I tell my mate, Ollie, the one who got me kicked off the fucking 82 Arts and Crafts team, right? Yeah. And then did the dirty with my ex. I told him this story, and all he said was this, what type of pizza was it? I went, what? <laughs> He went, what type of pizza was it that you ordered? And I went, what the fuck has that got to do with it? Pizza, pizza, it doesn't make a difference to the timing, does it? And he went, well, you say that. He said, but when I lived in Dubai, we were in an Italian restaurant at lunchtime uh, with my work colleagues. And um, we complained because we'd been waiting for ages. And we said, look, we've got to get back to work. Our pizzas have been half an hour. Why are they taking so long? And the Italian, it was in Dubai, but they were actually Italians in the restaurant went, Hey, what do you expect? He ordered quattro formaggi. And he went, what? What's that got to do with anything? And he goes, come on, everyone know. Four you pizzas. order quattro formaggi, it takes more time. Four cheeses, four time. And then just walked off. Fuck. Fucking hell. Have you ever heard what that? What was your pizza? What was it? Well, he just had a margarita, and I had a margarita with added spinach and olive. Well, that's not going to take any time at all. It's, a, it's just got nothing. Basic I could have ordered get. fucking a margarita with swan flesh and it shouldn't have fucking done some monkey Fuck blood sick. on top of it as well. There was no justification. But I don't know, have you ever heard that, that Quattro Fromaggi takes longer? Nah, never. I don't buy that. Feels like bollocks. It's just it's bollocks. No. Yeah. Fuck's sake. Anyway, sorry. England yeah. in Italy, 1980. England in Italy, 1980. Um, I'm using a Guardian piece about it uh, by Stephen Pye for that 80s sports blog as the source material. Stephen Pye. And Stephen Pye. Mm, Pye. Jonathan Cake. <laughs> and here, hello and welcome to the That Sports Blog podcast with me, Stephen Pye, and my colleagues, Jonathan Cake. Hello. <laughs> and Ian Biscuits. <laughs> yeah. And we're joined on the line from our Bundesliga expert, Hans von Kiesch. <laughs> Hans <Pad>. von Schnitzel <laughs> Hans von Schnitzel The greediest of all our contributors nom, 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 nom. Um, So 1980 England hadn't been in the tournament since 1970 Which seems mad When you think about it now And it was 14 years since they won the World Cup And Ron Greenwood was the manager formerly of West Ham, of course. Um, this was uh, a controversial decision. Everybody wanted Brian Clough to replace Don Revy yeah. in 77. Didn't get the job. And, um, Greenwood to be was fair, a company Brian Clough, man, wasn't he? Yeah. Brian Clough was still, I think, in the... Forest. Division 2 with Forest. I don't think they'd been promoted at what, that point. What, in just had, didn't they win the European Cup in no, 1980? Se- no, se- no, 77. I was, when wow, Don when Ron Greenwood got the job, yeah, sorry, yeah. when Greenwood got it. So maybe they thought that Clough was finished yesterday's man, but of course maybe. it wasn't. No, it was always a, um, a matter of control with Clough, wasn't it? And to be honest, so who knows was, whether he would have been a good England manager. I know that's sacrilege to a lot of football fans, but if you've read any books about Brian Clough and the way he went about his business, which I have, mm. he it was utterly deranged. There's no other way yeah. to put it. I mean, it was it was utter fucking madness, right? Who knows yeah. how it worked or why it worked, but it worked, right? Um, but it was about creating, a lot of it was about creating a sort of a mentality around a club, which I think might have involved day-to-day contact. 
there was a culture and a mentality around his clubs which were based on the yeah. cult of Brian Clough. Whether yeah, or not be- that would have translated to the England job where you've got time with your players every few months and they're used to working with other managers who work in completely different ways and then they turn up there and you're doing shit like punching them in the face or making them go for a walk around the fucking park and shit like this in the nettles yeah <laughs> and that now yeah. now then we are going for a short walk then we will come back we will sit in our rooms for the next three days then I will come to your room I will knock three times on the door when you open the door if I punch you in the face, that means you are selected to play. If I spit at you, <laughs> that means you will not be playing. Do you understand, young man? During those three days, you are to prepare your feet for the match by placing them in a washing-up bowl full of vomit, which you will produce yourself. <laughs> From your guts, via your throat and mouth. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah, the Forest teams that he built, he didn't necessarily go out and get the best players. It's that thing of of getting players with certain characters that would fit in with what he wanted to do. Yeah, I think they were just very... They were very good. One thing, when you read those books, like you you pick up on what they were very, very good at doing was picking the right players. A bit like, I suppose, you could compare, compare it to today's Brighton, where they would spot players in unusual places. Mm. And it wouldn't always be the super soul, though occasionally it was. And mm. they would pluck them sometimes from nowhere and fit them into a team and it would just work. But a lot of that was Peter Taylor. He was the guy yeah, who was went the, out was and, was, thing, yeah. uh, and was extremely good at spotting yeah. the right players. And um, when they split up, it all, all went a bit to ship for, for Clough yeah. when he didn't have Taylor with him. I mean, the England job, it's like almost being a diplomat. You're dealing yeah. with the best players in the country and you need to try and forge a team out of it. And, you know, Ron Greenwood would definitely have been better at that than, than like, Brian Clough would have been. Yeah. Jalapeño. Jalapeño. Plus, as well, people will say, I mean, obviously, I'm biased on West Ham. People, because they're comparing him to Clough, go, oh, he was this stiff corporate man. But Ron Greenwood's West Ham was the West Ham of Bobby Moore, Martin Peters and Jeff Hurst. They'd won yeah. in Europe. They'd won the World Cup. I know that annoys people, but effectively they had. And they'd won FA Cups and they'd always punched above their weight. And they'd done it playing extremely innovative forward-thinking football that was like mm. pretty rare in the top division, certainly in England in those days. So he was, people say, because of the way he looked and spoke, oh, it was the straight choice rather than Clough. And in personality terms, he, I suppose he was quite a formal guy. But in terms of football, he'd always, you know, West Ham had been known to be a very attacking, you know, flair team. So it wasn't as boring. It wasn't like when we fucking appointed Allardyce or Roy Hodgson, you know. Well, there was a lot of excitement, I remember, at the time because England were expected to do really well in this tournament because, like we said, Nottingham Forest had won the European Cup two years in a row. Kevin Keegan was the best player in Europe. Keegan was in Hamburg being the best player in Europe. Liverpool had won the European Cup two years before Forrest did. It was all gearing up. It was the it was first tournament age. to have eight countries in it. Yeah. Usually it was just four teams. Euro 76 had four teams in it. Yeah, I was going to say, is, when did it actually start as a tournament? I'm not sure when it started, but um, I, I know that the 76 one had just four teams and then... Wow. Um, let's have a look. It was uh, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Netherlands, and West Germany. Did Czechoslovakia and win it? Czechoslovakia, have Czechoslovakia won, it, won it, didn't they? On that was it the penalty shootout. Penenka right. scored. Uh, he was oh. named after that penalty. Oh yeah, he, the hipsters he, love that, don't they? I think the Guardian yeah. have done about four hundred different ten thousand word articles on that. On the Penenka. Yeah. Yeah, um, so that, yeah, Czechoslovakia won that. But back to 1980, um, two groups of four. We, group winners went straight to the final. That was it. Wow. Didn't even go to the semis. That's, I like Top this. Top the group, you're in the final. We're not <laughs> fucking about it. We've got 10 days to do this. We get out of the way. So England were in a group with Belgium and Italy and Spain, which That's sounds a tough. Tough group. Tough group. Um, Keegan had shook off a knee injury but there was suspicion he would be exhausted before the tournament began don't worry played, about me 
Exhausted is not a word in my personal dictionary. I've got a dictionary at home. Jean's mother bought it for me as a Christmas present. And the first thing (laughs) I did was I looked up the page with exhausted and exhaustion on, and I tore it out. It meant I also (laughs) lost some other important words beginning with E, but I didn't stop to think about that. I tore it out and I ate it. Including, funnily enough, excitement, which is one of my (laughs) words in my dictionary. So you win some, you lose some. <laughs> but I haven't noticed any drop in my excitement levels since I tore that page out, so that's good. I was worried about that. <laughs> um, no exhaustion versus his commercial commitments away from the game seem to be taking up more and more of his time, which will have been stuff like uh, adverts for brute soap with and his ice um, lolly range, etc. Henry et Cooper, his ice lolly range, all of that sort of thing arranged by that geezer we saw when we watched that documentary about him. He had that business manager, didn't he? Was it Fred Leatherland? No. <laughs> he had a man who just organised all of his commercial interests and flew yeah. him around places. Because no. you see him, he goes to the, like, is it the Gola factory or the Mitre factory or something in France? Yeah. To see his boots being manufactured. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Fred Leatherland was the fellow who had a shop, he, didn't he? And he gave, he was he gave Kevin a back room to use. Yeah, he was his, his boss, office. but Kevin didn't like him. <laughs> Fred Leatherland. <laughs> Uh, Are you watching dive- Fred Leatherland? Are you seeing this? <laughs> we should dive that book again. Yeah. <laughs> it might turn out completely differently. Um, Trevor Francis was injured. He'd had an Achilles injury. Oh, we haven't marked the passing of Trevor Francis on this podcast yet, so let's just say now, great loss to the game and a wonderful yeah. player. Yeah, yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. Really good... Um, media stuff as well when he used to do his commentary mm. core commentary it was always worth listening to and of course famously was sacked by Crystal Palace uh, to which to sacked by the chairman to which he responded but it's my birthday <laughs> yeah fucking right as well you can't sack a man yeah, on his sack birthday someone on their birthday he's fucking right everyone should have their birthday as a day off which should be an extra bank holiday yeah you've yeah. got a job Get your birthday off. Well, I'm Prime Minister. Um, well, you should say it. when you, Next time you go for a job, they go, if any questions, here's your contract. You go, yeah, can I have my birthday off? And they go, well, it's up to paid. you. You've got four weeks of holiday. You can choose no, that. No no no, 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 no. No, it's not holiday. It's an extra. It's like a personal yeah. bank holiday. It's important for self-care. Yeah. You don't have to... Have a whip round and get me a cake or a flowers or a, yeah, a present and have or a, a card. fucking awkward None stand that. around and you're going there eh. because I'm not going to be in. So you don't have to. You'll save on that. Everybody will save mm. on that. Just give me the cash. Just pay me for the work that I would normally God, do. But work so in. awful, isn't it? I mean, when you think about it, like you think about birthdays at work. We've all had them, or mm. having to celebrate other people's birthdays at work, and the whole kind of contrived fun and camaraderie that doesn't exist re- really but you have to pretend and if you don't pretend you're sort of marked out as difficult or grumpy yeah. that whole fucking I mean it's it, it's distilled and encapsulated by the work birthday but really every day there's something where you have to pretend that you're there out of choice and it's actually fun and enjoyable no when you could be walking in some botanical gardens or walking in some nettles, or have your yeah. feet in a washing up bowl full of sick. Anything, anything's better than work. Andy, let me ask you something. Do you remember okay. the squad who went out there to Ita- to Italy in 1980? I remember some of them. Yeah. Well, I want to do a game. I used to do this on the brilliant app Sporkle, which was a quiz app, oh, yeah. mainly sports yeah. quizzes, and they had brilliant things. In the end, I think I just did all the quizzes that I had any interest in, so I sort of it ran out of steam. But it was sometimes just name that squad. And it would say, right, right. Italia 90, and it would have... The clues were simply the position. And I think as a nudge, if you couldn't guess, you could then click club. And it would right. give, and, and that, that would give you an extra clue. And you could see if you could remember the entire... I remember getting the entire Italia 90 squad and being very happy. So I'm going to do that okay. with you now. I've got the entire uh, Italia 80 squad in front of me. Um, and by the way, it's like it's done in number order, so it's not like three keepers, then then eight defenders, and so forth. It's done in right. So the, the yeah. first eleven names that I'm going to read you is basically the first eleven, right? So number one, 
Goalkeeper. Shilton? No, the other one. Cle- Clements. Yeah. Uh, number two, uh, right back. Right, okay. Mick Mills. No, I, I might start giving clues. Right back. Phil Neal. Yeah, correct. Number three, left back. Um, was probably at Crystal Palace at this stage, later developed a chronic gambling problem. That's Kenny Sansom. Yeah. That's Do too you much remember that? Do you remember that time when I found a business card of Kenny Sansom in my old business card box? <laughs> no. I had a. No. I found a box. I was cleaning out an office, and it had all like you know when people used to give you business cards, and I'd keep them in my wallet, and then I'd put them in a box. And I had right. like a stack of them, like hundreds from over the years. And I was going through them before throwing some <laughs> out. And we were just about to record a podcast a few years ago, and there was one that just said Kenny Sansom former England footballer and Mm. it had his number and his email address and we did it I don't know if it was one of those many cases of you being a mind reader but I said to you I've got a business card in my hand of a former England footballer can you guess who it is oh the fun we've had over the years mate it's unbelievable isn't it just for Um, guessing games yeah and here we are again okay number four I think yeah he was a centre back uh, played for Liverpool as well Large of no Thompson? Correct. Number five, another centre back. Uh, I think this is Dave Watson. Correct. There was two really? Dave Watsons, wasn't there? Because there was one who came later. Yeah, the Dave Watson played, this one played for Sunderland in the 73 Cup final, and then went right. on to Man City, Southampton as well. Number six, very talented central midfielder, no longer with us, sadly. Ray Wilkins. Yeah. Number seven, Kevin Keegan. Correct. <laughs> number eight tricky winger also with Palace connections but would have been Steve playing Coppel. for United yeah uh, number nine I don't know this <sighs> bloke I think he was a. Uh, I don't even think of him as a centre forward as a number nine I, I think he played for Liverpool as a winger I think it's the David Johnson is it yeah am I right did really? he play for Liverpool as a winger yeah he was very forward for Liverpool yeah right uh, number ten the best central midfielder to have ever graced these aisles. Glenn Hoddle. No. <laughs> Trevor Brookin. Trevor Brookin. Okay. <laughs> and number 11. Mm. Um, I think we might have been talking about him earlier. Uh, he was a striker. He had a spell at Arsenal and also in Germany. Tony Woodcock. Correct. Woo! Okay, now we're getting into the... So you've got you've done very well there. You've got all of them. There's uh, 11 more names to come. Uh, The next one is number 12. He was also a right back. Played for Forest, then Arsenal, then Man United. Viv Anderson. Correct. Number 13, a goalkeeper with fairly racist views, let's be honest. Peter Shilton. Yeah. Uh... Number 14, don't even know this bloke played for. I'm assuming he was a defender and he is named after a fruit. I know this is Trevor Cherry. Yeah. Uh, Are you cooking something? I was just, yeah, I was scratching at something. (laughs) (laughs) Not quite a click, but I'll take your point. Okay, number 15, uh, I think he was captain. So I don't know why he's number 15. He was also captain, not just of this team in football, but also on a question of sport for many years. Alan Hughes. Yeah. Number 16. I think he was also a captain at some point. You mentioned him earlier, actually. A defender. Yeah. Uh, Doing well, yeah. Now, number 17. A player close to both of our hearts. Um, Probably best known for his pranks. And sometimes dressing up as an Arab prince. Terry McDermott. Yeah, Terry Mack. (laughs) Number 18. uh, I think he played for Liverpool. Um, But there was two people with this surname, actually. It's the surname of uh, an American political dynasty. Kennedy. So this is either going to be Ray Kennedy or Alan Kennedy. I'll go for Ray. Yeah, so which was which? 
Which was which? Alan Kennedy was the left back. And he played for He played for the they both played for Liverpool, yeah. Oh they both played for Liverpool, but the they same weren't time, related. Yeah. But Alan right. Kennedy went to my school, Shiny Road oh. Comprehensive. Wow, Ray well, Kennedy that, did not, that, but Ray Kennedy, Ray Kennedy was also from the northeast, but different part. Was, what was it? So, what position did Ray Kennedy play? Wing. Ray Kennedy was like a right winger or central midfielder. Right. Um, Number he, nineteen. He, uh, you mentioned his name earlier. He's a very talented player who. <laughs> Glenn Hoddle believes in reincarnation. Yeah. Glenn Hoddle. Number twenty. <laughs> another player who sadly is no longer with us. Centre forward. Uh, Paul I think Mariner. He was, yeah. Well done. Number 21, another centre-forward. Um, played for Forest and Manchester United. Gary Burles? Yeah. Whee. And number 22 was the third-choice goalkeeper. Now, this is usually Chris Woods, but I don't know if it was... was not in 1980. Not. not in 1980. Fuck. Who was the third-choice keeper? Hmm. I don't even know if he played for... I think it might be City. Joe Corrigan. Correct. Ray. Well, you did really well there, mate. Very well indeed. Thanks very much. I gave you a few clues, but I think you would have uh I think you would have got them all anyway if the clubs had been written yeah. next to them. Uh, it's it's yeah. been it, it's a very footballish uh subject this. So. Yeah, it I is, think. isn't it? Uh what we've got just trying to find what's coming. Oh, well, we'll we'll get into the tournament stuff next time, but um, we've got tear gas coming up. Oh, and, any water uh, cannons? Also, I like water cannons. I don't think there was water cannons, but we've got Ron Greenwood using the word bastards <laughs> as well, which I don't think you you get very often from an England manager. I don't right. think you get it from Gareth Southgate. Put it that way. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we've 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 laid the groundwork and we'll try and wrap it all up. Uh, oh my God, I've just looked at a photograph of uh, Kevin Keegan and Emlyn Hughes, both kissing Mrs. Thatcher on the cheek. Oh yeah, I know that picture. Well, she holds yeah, unfortunate. A ball. But As to Kenny be fair Sanson to Keegan, he takes exception to that in his book. He says a I lot of people that. have accused me of being a Thatcherite, but I'm from the north, and I yeah. and he was he's quite. He really sort of affirms his left wing credentials in the book and says he regrets. My that interest photo. in it was was purely sexual. It was purely sexual. <laughs> I'm not one of these who says you can't have it off with someone who doesn't with agree Tory. with your political beliefs. I'm I'd be off for, it. for the Tory. I'd put it under the category of what I call a hate fuck. Yeah, I mean, look at Penelope Keith. Even Michael Foot himself. If he came home and she was there in negligee offering it to him on a plate, you can't tell me that Michael Foot wouldn't have it off with yeah. Penelope Keith. She's, she's posher than cat's whiskers, but by gum. By gum. Just imagine it. Imagine her talking dirty in your ear in that cock glass voice. Imagine doing her over the pool table in a working men's club. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that'd be one for the fucking workers, I tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. More power to your elbow, comrade. That's what I'd say. (laughs) All right, that's it from this one. Uh, Thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.